Hey everyone, this is Chris. I know it has been a couple of weeks, but my work insanity is finally winding down. Uh, although I am still on call today, which means that at any moment my phone might go off with a cacophony of sound, reminding me that I need to be working. Uh, hopefully it's not gonna happen during the recording of this video, but Given the times that I have been paged this week, yeah, yeah, it could happen. It's better this afternoon than three o'clock in the morning, but maybe not by much. All right, so as you know, Gen Con is coming up in uh, about nine days now. Probably more or less correct by the time you see this video, but I'm <laughs> totally failing at doing basic math with dates. Uh, so I'm going to do a little bit of a different video today. I'm going to walk through the decks that I am thinking about bringing to the con. Uh, my normal strategy for Gen Con has been to do an Oprah style deck, uh, chock full of ways to pass resources around the table, give card draw to other players, and just sort of massively accelerate the consistency of the other three decks around the table. And that works really phenomenally when you are playing with people who have brought powerful decks. Um, I use it to great effect to really help a Baragond player get ramped up, find those extra attachments early, my deck had multiple copies of Unexpected Courage, so that Baragond basically was defending, I think, seven times around by turn three or so. Uh, but this year's Gen Con quest is a little different. It is not going to be a four or 12 player challenge mode quest. It's going to be two versus two head to head with the custom built wizard, uh, wizards, wizards quest encounter set that we're gonna get. Um, I still don't know how I feel about that, honestly, but it does mean that I need to bring a little bit of a different deck, a couple of different decks, because the Oprah deck just doesn't pull, its, pull enough weight with only one other deck to accelerate. So I'm going to walk you through what I'm thinking of bringing this year. I've got them on the table right here. Uh, not entirely final. I'm probably still going to tweak numbers a little bit before the con, but this is the sort of basic gist of the decks that I am bringing, at least for now. I've still got a week to change my mind, and that might happen. So let's get to it. First deck. On the block is this Mono Tactics Rush deck here. Starting off with our hero lineup, we have Hirgon, Bayorn, and Eowyn. Uh, and this hero lineup allows us to do something interesting right out of the gates. Uh, it allows us to quest really hard right away. Turn one, gonna contribute six willpower to the quest, almost certainly. Uh, there's definitely some allies we could play that would allow us to contribute a little more, but the odds are very good that unless the initial encounter setup is just absolutely massive, that we're going to sort of hold off and play a little more slowly. The six willpower here is phenomenal, really adds a lot to the other deck as well. Helps us guarantee that we get the extra resource acceleration from Hirgon's ability. And Eowyn allows us to do something else in combination with Bayorn that nearly no other hero allows us to do. Uh, we could use Boromir and that would help a little bit, but he's pretty lacking in the questing department. Um, what Eowyn and Bayorn allows us to do is take one big enemy right away and just completely remove it from the board. I did a test earlier with Journey Down the Anduin, and it is incredibly refreshing to start the game off with 27 threat, see that hill troll sitting in the staging area, 
flip up some non-enemy encounter card and decide, okay, it's turn one, let's just kill the hill troll right now. And you can do that because Bayorn can soak up nearly any attack on the first turn. I mean, there's the possibility for some enemies, some shadow effects that might make that not work out in every quest, but there's plenty where he can take any hit you want right away. And if you use Aelin's ability to ready her and set her attack to 10 for the rest of the phase, combined with Bayorn's five attack, you can take out a massive enemy. And yes, I, I know that just Eowyn and Baragon can do similar things, uh, but because we don't know what's coming up, uh, I'm opting for Bayorn just to be a little different. And because I think that extra five attack might actually be a big determining factor. Especially if we end up battle questing, that is gonna be a bit of a challenge. All right, so that's the heroes. Let's talk about what else is in this tactics deck. We've got a lot of warriors with a little bit of new attachment synergy. Uh, we have the warrior of Dale who gets ranged and plus one attack whenever you attach something to him and it's cheaper to get him weapons. Guthlaf, who comes in for two resources or one if you quested successfully with Hirgon and has Sentinel. And the Gondorian Spearman, the corset classic that just pokes down little enemies, which is exactly what we want. And to sort of back them up, we have Raiment of War and Bow of You. Bow of You is great because it's free. It's just like a little bit of extra damage that you can put on nearly anything. Uh, and Raymond War is phenomenal because it allows you to beef up something like this Gondorian Spearman uh, and turn him into a defender that can actually survive more than one attack. You can't see it out right now, but we're going to talk about it in a minute. The other deck has three copies of Hallberg of Mail uh, because there's a bunch of allies in here that would love plus one defense, plus one hit point, like these Gondorian Spearmen. And that is not a restricted attachment, so your characters can have that and the Raymonds of War. Laying this out, I realized that I'm probably going to screw this up at some point, but Guthlof, though he has Sentinel, is not a warrior. Uh, I may need to find a replacement for him. So we, we have a bunch of these, um, and I totally forgot to pull the last attachment synergy out, but we've got Bofur, allows us to go digging for weapons like the two Raymond of War and Bow of You that we're just talking about. Uh, he also has two attack and two willpower, which makes him a nice beefy body if you don't think you're going to get an attachment. Just scoop those up. We've also got some nice event synergy here with a very specific plan. Faint classic tactics event allows you to knock out a big attack. Really important when Bayorn is getting low on health or if the other deck has engaged a big enemy and really can't deal with it itself. And we have Book of Eldekar, which we can play on either of the other two heroes to recycle faint, and the eagles are coming, which does at least double duty in this deck, if not triple duty. We are running a bunch of eagles because Landreval is fantastic with Bayorn, as you probably already know, and the eagles are coming is a great way to pull those allies out of your deck so that you can get them into play. Uh, and we have a good mix of eagles, They have great stats for how, for how inexpensive they are. And if we do end up battle or siege questing, that is going to be a big, big factor in whether or not we succeed. Unfortunately, none of them are warriors, even though they have Sentinel, which means that they also can't wear the armor, as awesome as that would have been. Uh, but the, the third thing that the Eagles Are Coming does is it shuffles your deck. 
So if you've already used a Book of Eldakar to put a feint back on the bottom of your deck, or to put another copy of the Eagles Are Coming back on the bottom of your deck, the Eagles Are Coming gives you a way to shuffle it back in so that you have another chance to draw it. This deck is never going to make it all the way through all the cards, uh, and potentially being able to reliably get to six or seven copies of Feint through the deck, as opposed to the sort of four-ish that I would expect from Natural Card Draw and Book of Eldakar shenanigans is a big deal. So that is where we are going with that. Pick up all the cards. And, you know, we're just going to round out the deck with some nice, simple, basic allies that do good things for us. Uh, Honor Guard allows you to prevent some damage across the board. Uh, we do have healing in the other deck, but sometimes being able to prevent a damage is important because you have allies that only have one hit point. Uh, and Legolas, ranged attack is great. Paying three for him because of Hirgon is fantastic. He is a warrior, so he can use the bow. And he does offer you some card draw, so that is going to be a big piece in sort of successful plays with this deck. And that's about all the cards I feel like talking about from Tactics. This is more Tactics cards than I ever talk about. Uh, so let's move on to deck number two, and we can talk about all the ways that they are built to work together. Starting off with my favorite hero, of course, Theodred, as you might expect, given this is me we're talking about. And this deck is meant to work with that deck very nicely, and being able to pass extra resources over is just one piece of that. We also have Elrond. Uh, we're going to have a bunch of allies with a decent number of hit points in both decks, and having a way to give them even more. Effective hit points through magnifying healing is great. Uh, this is a Trisphere deck with Frodo as our third hero, so Elrond's ability to pay for allies of any sphere is going to come in handy, guaranteed. Although I had to resist the urge to put a couple tactics allies in here anyways, because the other deck can handle that much more effectively. Uh, and Frodo is a low threat spirit hero that is unlikely to already be present on the table. Uh, and his ability allows him to be a very effective emergency outlet for damage. Right, if you come across something like Hummerhorns with Frodo on the table, you don't lose a hero. If you take a big undefended attack during questing because you get an enemy that comes out and swings right away, you don't lose a hero because of Frodo. And you can plan for this sometimes when this deck is low on threat and the other one is not. Uh, you take an enemy away from the other deck and just accept like, okay, I will take an undefended attack. My threat will go up by four or five because of Frodo's ability and I'll still be below the combat deck, so it'll work out okay. Uh, and that's what we're hoping for here. So let's talk about all the cards that are intended to help these decks work together. We've got the Hauberk of Mail, like I said before. Uh, there's a bunch of warrior characters in the other deck that would really appreciate an extra one defense and one hit point. I need to reconsider Guthlaf, as I said, but this attachment is incredibly good at turning those defenders into meaningful allies. Also have Errand Rider, which is going to help this deck smooth out its resources and enable us to do some sort of shenanigans. Uh, this came up during my testing earlier today, but sometimes you need to put Theodred's resource on Frodo in order to play a Test of Will if there's a treachery that comes up that needs to be cancelled. But if that treachery doesn't come up, and you don't have a bunch of extra spirit cards in your hand, that extra resource can feel like it was a little wasted. So being able to errand rider that resource back to Elrond or Theodred afterwards is phenomenal. 
And we've got Envoy of Pelagir. Um, four of the heroes in this fellowship are good targets for the extra resource. There's Eowyn, who is noble, Hirgon, who is Gondor, Theodrid, and Elrond are noble. Uh, I wish it could give resources to Frodo, but, you know, noble as a keyword has a very specific meaning in Lord of the Rings, and Frodo doesn't count. But anyways, this is just an ally who has good stats, which you can pay for with resources of any sphere. So, you know, if Theodrid builds up too many, or if Frodo ends up getting ahead of the cards that I have in spirit, being able to just dump those resources and share with another hero is going to help smooth things out. We've got Deep Knowledge, of course, because a card that raises everyone's threat by two to draw everyone two cards is amazingly good, uh, especially in a pair of decks that is intended to sort of come out swinging a little bit. Although this deck is not as fast as the other one, its initial turns are not quite as explosive. And of course, to go along with Elrond, we've got Wardens of Healing. Any sort of archery splash damage, Necromancer's Reach style effect, Warden of Healing takes care of those incredibly well. Uh, and with Honor Guard in the opposite deck, we'll be able to protect the Wardens of Healing a little bit from damage that comes their way through those sorts of effects. Even still, worth remembering for me that you don't necessarily want to just dump all the Wardens of Healing on the table if you don't know what's coming in the encounter set. Oops, sorry, Frodo. The second set of cards that are going to really help these two decks work well together are a little bit of encounter deck control. And by far, the two shining stars of that are Jubair and Ferial. They both have phenomenal stats, despite the fact that they're expensive. Um, Jubair can massively negate shadow cards. Ferial helps you to avoid some of the worst things that the encounter deck has available. And I know both of these are a little bit muted in a two-player game, especially given that the opposite deck has so much combat potential that Jubair may not or may be overkill. Uh, but he also synergizes fantastically with Raiment of War, Hallwork of Mail, uh, just to build an absolutely incredible defender. So I think he's worth a couple of slots, especially given that he's easier to play in this deck than in a lot of others. There's also a couple copies of Miner of the Iron Hills. Uh, it's, it's been a little while since I've been bitten by a condition attachment, but they do exist. Some of them are quite nasty, so being able to drop those and get an ally on the table that can help you fight is great. Obviously, a test of will has been a staple in sort of unknown multiplayer settings for basically as long as the core set has existed. If I had more copies easily accessible, I would seriously consider putting it in both decks, but I don't, and I don't feel like dealing with that crossover. And the last fun card in this sort of we're countering the encounter deck setup that I think is really absolutely worth mentioning is Tides of Fate. It's a little different from Hasty Stroke in that it doesn't prevent you, it doesn't save you from a lot of different shadow effects. You know, anything that discards attachments or adds characters to the staging area is, you know, it's, it's not something that Tides of Fate can do anything about, but boosting attack is an incredibly common shadow effect. And the ability to then spend two resources to tactics resources, which we should have a bunch of, as a rider to ready your defender and give them a big boost to attack power, I, I expect that card is going to pay dividends absolutely massively. Oh, and I forgot to pull this one out, but of course, because we have Elrond, we've also got a couple of copies of A Burning Brand, 
just because then Elrond can also be a very solid defender without having to worry about shadow effects. You've sort of got the encounter deck on lock here, is the idea. And there's a bunch of other efficient allies, sneak attack, Gandalf, that sort of stuff in this deck. Uh, but for the most part, I think that mix is very, very open to change. Whereas this is the set of stuff that I really want this deck to focus on. I want to be able to share resources and cards across the table. I want attachments to play that synergize well with both sets of allies in either deck so that we have a better chance of getting them out of our hands and into play. Uh, and I want a bunch of cards in this deck that sort of allow me to keep the encounter deck in check a little bit. And that's what we've got. I have done some play testing. It's very different from my usual strategy of just playing one deck at a time. Uh, it also means that there are lots of things that I sort of don't feel comfortable doing, like bringing Steward of Gondor in the leadership support deck, because I know that there's a pretty good chance somebody else will have Steward of Gondor, and I don't want my games to turn into a bit of a race. Like, oh, if I get my Steward first, I can do all these cool things, but if you get your Steward first, then I have to sort of play a little more slowly. That's, that's not really what I'm after. There are uniques in each deck, however, so obviously there's some potential for that regardless. Uh, but I think I am willing to accept that risk. And honestly, worst case, if I show up and my decks are hopelessly overlapping with other people's, um, let's borrow one. It'll be fine. All right, um, I think that about wraps it up and it's about all the time I can afford given that I still have some work to do today. Haven't been paged yet, so that's a plus. Uh, but if you see me at Gen Con, say hi. You know what I look like. I'm gonna be at a bunch of the Lord of the Rings events, the Cardboard of the Rings special listener event, plus the after hours at Slippery Noodle, which is still absolutely the stupidest name for a pub that I have heard in a very long time. Uh, but yeah, seriously, I would love to meet you if you watch the video. So if you're at the con, come say hi, come hang out, play some cards. It'll be great. Thanks for watching.